Good morning. Uh, glad to be here on uh, July 20th, uh, 2020. Um, so we're going to start into right away some of the things that are going on with COVID. Uh, there are now uh, 5,765 positive cases in Escambia County. We're over 5,082 of them are residents. So again, we, uh, we're over now 5,000 cases of residents in Escambia County. Uh, the latest update has statewide shows a 6%, uh, I mean, a 9.6% positivity rate uh, for July 18th. Uh, COVID-19 uh, hospitalizations uh, were 217 uh, for July 18th and hospitalizations 217 Saturday, July 18th and hospitalizations were 202 on July um, 17th and 207 on July 16th. Um, There's a slight typo on, on dates here that threw me there for a second. But again, we were at 217 on Saturday. We did not have Sunday numbers from Baptist. There was a slight increase in West Florida and Sacred, but obviously not knowing the complete picture without getting the Baptist numbers. We will have those today when we get everything in. Again, this is all sort of dependent upon people sending in um, text and certainly over the weekend and emails. Uh, if I didn't get one of those emails, uh, we have an incomplete list, but we will update that today for both Sunday's numbers and uh, and, be, and today's numbers. Again, we went from the 16th, we're at 207. We went down on the 17th to 202, uh, but we were up uh, to 217 on Saturday, and we don't have Sundays at this point, but we will get that out there. Um, face coverings, just a reminder uh, that a face covering re is required uh, and it, it remains in effect inside businesses within the city of Pensacola limits and other businesses, other city buildings. Um, we certainly advise it uh, to, uh, if you're gonna be in close contact with anybody even outside, certainly if you're exercising something like that, you're not required to do it. But if you get to a point where you're in a large congestion, uh, we certainly advise it in there as well. Um, uh, please continue to wear your mask. Um, and again, continue to wash your hands, uh, continue to social distance and wear a mask. Uh, those are the three things that come out of our conversations with the hospitals. Again, I'll be having uh, conversations with the hospitals again this afternoon at two o'clock. Um, uh, draft budget available online. A draft of the fiscal year 2021 budget for the city of Pensacola is now available online. Uh, the budget and brief information guide for citizens. Some highlights of the approximate uh, $236 million fiscal year in budget is that there's no millage increase. There's a balanced budget despite the COVID-19 uh, economic impacts. Um, an estimated one, uh, 104 million in local option sales tax revenue uh, to cover a variety of items, including 1.4 million in upgrades and refurbishments to some of the city's parks, community centers, and facilities, and 1.3 million for public works and facilities to address citywide ADA improvements, uh, energy conservation and efficiency improvements intersection and sidewalk improvements and the continuation of the pavement management program. Uh, also going on right now, we have a just a reminder that our resident satisfaction survey is going out. We encourage all citizens to participate and let their voices be heard. City residents uh, are asked to complete the online survey at uh, uwf.edu slash Haas resident survey or by phone at 850-495-2666. Uh, by August, uh, by Sunday, August 9th. Uh, the city's annual survey is being conducted by the UWF Haw Center. All data obtained from participants will be kept confidential and will only be reported as an aggregate form. Um, so again, please, if you get a chance, uh, let us know what's going on with your, uh, with your information. Also, just for you to know, um, we, are, we are starting back again, our second our employee satisfaction survey uh, we did that last year. It gave us a bunch of things to go off of. We would have hoped to have been uh, much earlier than this. Obvi obviously, COVID pushed us back from March, April to now uh, July, August, but uh, we are in the middle of, of, uh, of putting that out. And so we'll have from our employees and listen to them and, and we're continuing to survey them and, and, and listen and see how we can continue to make our, ourselves better in our delivery of services. So that's why we also depend on you, our citizens, to tell us as well. And we will work on uh, on all of these things for better service delivery for you. Um, mayor's Neighborhood Cleanup. Uh, just a reminder that the Mayor's Neighborhood Cleanup will be uh, this Saturday, uh, July 25th, in the Eastgate, uh, Parker uh, Creek and Palisades area. I think that's 
Parker Circle um, area. The mayor's neighborhood cleanup uh, um, allows residents to clean up areas uh, to leave items at the curb and clean up on the day of the pickup from the city sanitation services. Cleanup includes bulk items such as household appliances, furniture, mattresses, bicycles, toys, tires, and old paint. Learn more at cityofpensacola.com. Also, um, some DOT closures uh, and some city closures that we want to talk to you about. A uh, reminder that FDOT, uh, the, 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 they have closed 17th Avenue, will be closed from US 98, which is the bridge essentially to Graffiti Bridge. It began uh, 8 p.m. last night, uh, Sunday, July 19th. This, that section of 17th will be closed through 6 a.m. Um, Saturday, July 25th. I, I, I got caught up in that this morning and came down and got rerouted to Gregory, but again, you can still use it. You can still come to downtown that way. It's just going to, you're not going to be able to get all the way to the bridge. Uh, and we ask that you work with that um, and understand that it's going to be happening uh, for the next week. Again, Saturday at, at 6 a.m. it will be lifted. Uh, so again, just this week, uh, please make note that that closure will be hit air. Local traffic on 17th will be able to, will be maintained as well access to the boat launch and the visitor center. Uh, planned construction activities are weather dependent and may be delayed or rescheduled in the event of inclement weather. So obviously uh, right now uh, they're able to get things going because the weather's working, but if something happens, it could potentially delay that. Also want to talk to you about um, Langley Avenue. Uh, in the closure that we are seeing right there. The city is doing a project uh, to create a traffic circle there at Hilltop. It's supposed to be able to get people in and out of the new soccer complex, but also uh, be able to slow traffic down. One of many measures that we're taking to slow traffic down on Langley. Uh, unfortunately, it was our hope and our plan was to keep one lane open uh, and have a detour. Uh, that did not work as we worked with the city of Pensacola. We had people running through uh, the wrong way. Uh, we eventually brought police out there, even with police and, and traffic trying to work it together. It just was not working. Uh, so both both parties, and I talked to uh, Chief Leiter last night, and he told me, hey, I, I'm, I made the call. I was happy to do that. I support him in that call. We got to have safety. And so at this point, we will we have shut down all traffic there, and we're rerouting the detour. Uh, we ask you to please work with us, slow your speeds, find an alternative opportunity. If you live in the Scenic Heights area at this point, either think about using Summit or Creighton, whichever is easiest for you to use. Langley at this particular point will be worked on. The good news is this should, uh, barring any weather delays, should allow us to move construction ahead of schedule. Uh, but again, we ask you to, to please uh, start thinking of alternate uses uh, to get in and out of Scenic Heights if you're going back to Ninth Avenue. Again, we ask you to think about either going down to uh, 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 down to Summit or up to Creighton and use those streets at this particular time until we can get Langley back open. We will get it back open. This will allow us to speed up uh, construction. But at this particular time, there were too many people trying to do things that were unwise and, and potentially dangerous. And so we just chose to shut the whole uh, access down at this particular time. Um, again, construction is going forward and uh, hopefully when it's finished, It'll be a great finished product for the neighborhood, but more than anything else, we'll get Langley back open. So um, I ask you to continue to work with us on that. Um, and again, try to find another route uh, for you that would be workable uh, during this interim construction period. Lastly, um, I know that we also have construction on Bayou Boulevard. Uh, I think that is coming to uh, nearing completion. That was part of the um, uh, project that was going to be putting in some drainage, uh, but we also uh, were able to fix some drainage on that street that we had had a buildup in the bike lane of water. Um, so all of that was being worked on. I really appreciate everyone over in Public Works. I know we're getting close to the end of that, but it's still going as well. So we have a few closures at this particular time, but we're getting all the construction done. Uh, we should have it all done up and ready for you. And when it we reopens, uh, all of those places will be much safer, much easier for you to use. And, and we're excited to see uh, what, what will come uh, with with the new work being done. But uh, those are just a few closures and some road construction to be aware of. Um, with that, um, I would say a couple of things and then I'll turn it over to y'all. I did just want to say there's a lot of questions still continuing to go on with the issue of the monument. And I I realized we we last week we discussed a little bit the week before 
uh, we'd put our our 17 page memo and I guess certainly realizing that that um, that not a lot of people read it or had a chance to see it. So I kind of wanted to elaborate where we were, how decisions were made and what happens. There's no doubt um, that I think from a from a distance, uh, the statue that we have at um, the Confederate statue that we have at, at, on Florida Square is um, is, is certainly has the appearance uh, that it is a veterans monument. It says some things about veterans that you can clearly see in big print, uh, and it certainly has a soldier on it. Um, I, like most of you, necessarily didn't see it as a hateful object. I saw this more as a veterans as well, um, but it's not a veterans monument, and the reason you can tell is when you get closer. And I mean, I'm one of the first uh, probably over a month ago that made a mistake on this. I, I was talking to a citizen that said we had a monument for Jefferson Davis, and I, I communicated back to the individual that, that we did not have a monument for Jefferson Davis. We had a monument to uh, uh, Confederate soldiers who lost their lives. Little did I know until I got closer up, and when you walked up and you saw what's on there, that indeed I was wrong. Um, it is a monument to Jefferson Davis. It was a monument to other individuals who um, I think as we've seen what was documented both on the report and through the news journal um, uh, used the intent and, and perhaps mask it with what they were doing with veterans to mask an intent uh, that, they in, that they intended to display. For those reasons for me it was uh, it was um, it was going to be impossible um, to have to show the veterans portion without without some significant changes. Um, I've been I've been here saying for a long time that I thought that what we could do was better explain it um, in, in, in give monuments to other people that are here. And if we could find a way to do that, we evaluated that in the process and ended up it was going to be significantly expensive for us to do it. Um, so we felt like it was the right decision for us to move forward uh, to remove the monument. Uh, many people are also continuing to say, well, this is just a, a you're a prisoner of the moment um, from what's happening. But I will remind you that in this millennium, which is only 12, 20 of its thousand years old, this item has come up about five times, 2000, 2006 or, uh, or so, 2015, 17, and now 2020. Um, this is a, a monument that continues to have challenges because of that close up history. And without being able to fairly um, and equitably uh, tell everyone's story in that space, um, I don't think it alone can stand there. It's not an issue of what um, of what we what we were doing or trying to erase history. As many of the of the council members said, it's not the intent to erase history. It's just the intent to, to relocate history uh, because we haven't done a good job of telling the whole story of history. Um, so again, as we move forward with our history, I hope uh, that we'll find some resolution on that. I hope you realize also. Um, that again, there were parts of it that did clearly appear to be uh, veterans and, and associated with those that fought. Uh, but I think if you really get up close to the monument and you really look at the things that were on it, um, is when I went up close to it and saw that and saw mistakes I made in, in emailing people, um, you know, it, it clearly carried more than just a veterans monument. And the reason I also know that is when we were talking about trying to find places for the city council, to relocate it, we went to the Veterans uh, Park uh, and asked about it. They would relocate it there, and they indicated that they did not believe that it was exclusively about veterans. Um, and again, for a number of reasons, uh, it, it is not viewed as simply a veteran statue. There's other baggage along with it in some of the, the comments that are on the statue. And I think when we became uh, cognizant of that, we either thought we've either got to figure out a way to include everybody and if we can't do that, then we need to look at removal. Um, I can assure you that removal is not at the top of my list. I would have rather found a way to tell everybody's story, but I cannot argue with staff uh, the amount of money because of the 50 foot height that would have required for us to equitably tell everybody's story was simply too much. And at that point, uh, we made a decision, the staff made a decision that they recommended that rather than spending a lot more money on our past, we should be spending money on our future. Um, and on that note, I totally agree with staff and that was the presentation that was made uh, to the council and they made their decision. Uh, we continue to keep moving forward as a community. We have a lot of things in this community. As you probably heard on the, what we were just talking about some of the closures. We will stay focused on, on monies that we can spend on our, our collected and united future uh, rather than our, our, um, 
our different past and, and certainly our, our challenges that we've had in telling that story for a number of years. Uh, but again, uh, that was kind of a little bit I wanted to, to do. I've certainly gotten a number of emails out there and I wanted to sort of lay that out for everybody for a better understanding as to what happened as we went through that. I'm open to questions uh, from you, uh, the, uh, the press, and so I'll answer those as they come in. Casey? Sure. The first question sure. is, the first from question Jenny, is from Jenny Weekly. Um, can you address the lawsuit regarding the Confederate monument? What is the city's basic position? Um, we we obviously have had the lawsuit. Um, if you if you remember, there are both st state and federal items that before we got ready to vote, Susan did a great job of looking through those. Uh, we don't believe the the vote related to remains uh, has anywhere. Uh, to stand on and so we obviously will be uh, defending the council's position uh, in court. Uh, we obviously know the three individuals who are on the marker uh, and we know where they are individually buried and at this particular time, um, what, 20, um, 25, 26 years after the end of the Civil War, we don't have any remains of any soldiers that were buried there. So there are no remains associated with the monument. It is simply a monument that's there. Um, so again, we don't believe, as, as um, Susan put it, in both her state and federal um, statutes don't apply to this particular monument. Um, along those lines, we are having some, Susan is having some assistance um, that was offered. Uh, it wasn't totally pro bono, it was a much reduced rate. Um, and so she is working, my understanding, uh, Bruce Partington with Clark Partington offered assistance to her and she has accepted that at a very reduced rate. I'm sure we're covering sort of their 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 cost, uh, but uh, but again, from that standpoint, uh, it was uh, offered to be defended at a, at a very reduced rate and she took them up on that and we're, we're moving forward. And this is from Jeremy too. Have you heard anything from the county regarding a potential mask mandate? Specifically, have you spoken with either the commission chairman or the county administrator? You know, I, I, I have not spoken with them since um, action last Thursday. Uh, I did speak with them prior to that action. Um, the chairman was less optimistic about that. Um, you know, again, I, I we've had our discussions on it. Um, I have my positions. City has its position. County has its position. I don't I don't know that we're necessarily going to change them at this particular time at this position. Uh, I continue to remind them that uh, that we as local leaders ask for the opportunity to lead. I don't think we need the governor to come in and tell us we have to do something. I think we should be able to responsibly enough uh, to be able to make those decisions. I was on, um, I know Dave's out there, Dave Dunwoody, I was on NPR on Saturday on an interview and I was asked several questions about uh, Governor DeSantis and I, I commented that I, I can't believe that every place in the state of Florida is seeing the same and experiencing the same thing. Um, uh, if there's anything, I, I don't want him to, to create a blanket uh, condition for everybody. I would rather remind everybody that they need to respond accordingly. And if you are certainly in a red area, um, you and local government should be making those decisions. Um, we made that decision. Uh, I did have some, I did receive several texts over the weekend from individuals um, uh, or I guess Facebook posts as well from individuals who were small counties that I knew and when, when I was president of the Florida Association of Counties who were very thankful uh, for the stance I took because they don't have the impact that we're having, but they totally understand that that if you're in kind of a, uh, a significant hotspot red area uh, that you and your local area should have the authority to create mask mandates and that you should do that. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to create a point where I'm telling somebody else who's not in the same condition I am, but clearly in the two county area we find ourselves in at this point in Scambia and Santa Rosa, uh, we, are, we are having challenges. I mean, if you look also uh, to our west, uh, Baldwin and Mobile County are also having the same challenges. They are under a state mandate, um, but I mean, they certainly should have been doing the same thing in Baldwin and Mobile County. We should be doing the same thing in Scambia and Santa Rosa County. Uh, when you look at the city of Pensacola, the city of Gulf Breeze, we have enacted these ordinances. Uh, but again, um, I'm going to be on there today with the healthcare providers, and uh, they've continued to tell me to message 
a couple of things. One, um, social distance, wash your hands, wear a mask. So wear a mask is part of it. The other one is if you are, if you have been sick and you are recovered, 28 days recovered, 14 days recovered with a negative test, um, that you please give your blood um, uh, to, to one blood. And I think we have that, um, Casey, don't we have that on our, uh, on our social media and website where they can go to one blood to be able to give blood their plasma that could be used to uh, fight off um, any problems that people currently have with the disease and certainly could help with finding a cure or, or at least a vaccine for the disease. And yes, we do have that information on our social media. Um, next question is from Andrew McKay. The Langley closure caught everyone by surprise, especially closing both directions. I'm hearing horror stories about traffic in the neighborhood. Also, when school starts in August, what's the plan for the school traffic? Uh, we will have to work. We did not anticipate this happening, Andrew, this quickly. Um, so that was not our anticipation either. Uh, but I think if you heard me talk about the um, what ended up happening with Chief Leiter, uh, we got called out there. The police did. It, it was it was chaos trying to happen. Everybody was trying to, you know, we'd set up a. Um, you can always set up and engineer anything to work. Uh, the problem is whether the people actually follow what you put in there. And we had many people that were trying to run the stretch through the wrong way. Uh, which was potentially dangerous um, in, in just a, a variety of things. We tried some different other options, but because of the way you can't really go south around Langley, you can only really go north around Langley. Uh, there was no real way for us to work it. Um, it was not anticipated to close in both directions at this point. We're about 10 days earlier than we expected, but we felt like if we went ahead and did it, it would help us get the construction done faster and we'd be able to open it back up. I, I don't exactly have the date um, in Casey. I, I don't think they gave me the date exactly this morning of when they think they'll be done. So I don't know if we'll meet the school at this particular time. But uh, again, I think we would advise everyone that they begin to figure out different ways that they can either get to uh, Summit or if they can get to Creighton, uh, whatever's the easiest way for them to go. Um, to begin to get out of there. Um, this is a temporary problem. We will get this fixed with some construction. Uh, obviously, right now at Perry and, 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 um, and Bayou Boulevard, we're having some of the same problems. They're creating detours. We're going to be finished there soon, and that'll fix up. Uh, this will eventually be finished. This isn't a huge um, construction job. We should be able to get this done. We're having the same thing happen in the middle of beach season at 17th and the bridge. So. Uh, these are things that happen with construction. Progress uh, creates temporary problems. We ask you right now to go out and try to find a solution. We've put together some ideas that we have in the detour. The main thing is we'd ask you to please try to keep your speeds down. And again, try as fast as you can to get to a road that is more suitable for that kind of traffic, whether it's going all the way down to Summit, whether it's going up to Creighton, um, those obviously those streets were, were made to handle things like Langley uh, and we're just continuing to work through. And I think right now the um, anticipated completion date of that is October 8th. Um, it was about a 90 day project from when it started. So um, the next question is from Andrew McKay as well. Is work on the soccer complex itself going to come after the roundabout is done? And what's the expected finish date? You know, um, we, we, we're going to be um, we're going to be working on that. We uh, we we had some so our bids came out significantly uh, higher than what we expected. So we're coming back and looking to see what we can do and put something together. Uh, the good news is I was just talking to uh, some of the I was out this morning. When I was walking, ran into some people that were very involved in, in youth soccer. We were talking about it. Uh, obviously, what it looks like this year is probably much of our fall season is going to be lost um, due to COVID. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think our goal is to try to have this ready to go for spring, and it, it works out well. We'll have the construction done, we'll have the fields done, and uh, we had COVID. So, hopefully, by the spring, we will get out of COVID, and then we'll have the road done and the and the fields done. And, and again, it, it wasn't our intention to go this direction, but it looks like it may work and, and everything may come together at the right time um, dealing with COVID. But uh, 
again, uh, the construction part of it, we knew was going to happen. The construction part of it not only serves the, uh, the soccer fields, it will ultimately slow traffic down Hilltop and, um, and, and, and Langley there. Uh, you know, when we were in the middle of doing this, uh, Keith and Kareth and I went out and took a look at, at that intersection. We actually went and talked to the people on the corners and it was amazing to hear them tell stories of wrecks and other things that happen on that corner uh, because of the way the actions people take and, and generally uh, driving through at too high to too high a speeds before they realize they have to take the corners they do. Um, so again, I, I think when this is done, this will be so much safer for everyone on Hilltop, everyone on Langley, and, and again, everybody that drives those stretches. Um, it'll, it'll create a, a slow, down atmosphere at this point. Obviously, we're, we're just going through the the, uh, uh, the difficult point of getting the construction done. And Brian Cooper is telling me that there's a, a pre-bid meeting tomorrow for the soccer complex. And then, of course, we have to advertise and get bids um, and hope to have it completed by uh, March 1st. So just in time for spring soccer, hopefully to come back around no COVID. Yep, you're soaping. Um, and the next question is from Jeremy. Um, is the city in the red now? Um, I mean, we, we are technically in a yellow. Our city staff is in back to green. We've actually uh, moved ourselves back into green. Um, this has been an incredible job of, of management. When I, I So often I'm the one standing here and discussing and talking with you, but I don't have a chance to really tell you about some of the things that are going on in the people and the work that they're doing. Um, I, I tell you the job that both Chief Leiter um, and Chief Craner have done with their two organizations who are at the, they're the tip of the spear for us. Um, what's happening right now with Brian Cooper and Parks and Rec and, and Derek and Public Works, uh, John Pittman and Sanitation. Um, all of these areas are working diligently to make sure that we have enough people and enough bodies to do the work we need to do. At this particular time, we, as, this, as the city of Pensacola, the, the, the actual uh, organization, are at the um, are in the green. But uh, but as a city as a whole, we find ourselves in yellow because of our um, our hospitals. Um, again, I look forward to two o'clock. I mean, our hospital execs haven't told us we're necessarily red at this point, uh, but they agree that we are we are solidly in the yellow, uh, and there are challenges facing each of their hospitals as they try to 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 figure out what to do. Um, this is the reason we're asking all of you. This is the reason we think it's a two county area. When fifty percent of the people wake up in the morning from Santa Rosa County and come to work in Escambia County, uh, it really is a two county issue that we've got to work together on. Uh, we've got to do everything we can to get our numbers down um, so that our hospitals will not get overrun. That's the whole purpose that we did. Uh, we got into this in the, in the starting process. Uh, this is what we're trying to, to stop and achieve. Uh, we're trying to stop. Um, uh, if you get in a car accident or something else, we want to make sure that when you get there, there's enough medical service there to service your needs. And again, I'm told at this point that we are in the yellow, that we can totally do that, but we need to be very concerned about where COVID is. And we should be taking all actions, every one of us, every one of us as a citizen of the two county area have the ability to help. And that includes washing your hands, socially distance and wearing a mask. If we do all three of these things, we should be able to see our numbers come down. Uh, again, it'll be interesting on Wednesday to see where we are. Um, you know, we, we, we're starting to see a little bit of flattening in the hospitalizations. We're still having increases, but we are seeing flattening that's not as steep as it was at one time. Uh, but we, 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 there's no doubt we're still seeing increases. So um, we just got to continue to do what we're doing. And the things that we've asked you to do, um, uh, we, 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 we please ask you that you comply with us. And this is from Daniel at WKRG. Is the city moving forward with finding a contractor to move the monument despite the lawsuit? Um, we we are still looking at all those things. Absolutely. We, we communicated to the council uh, that it could be some time because there are only a handful of people that do uh, monuments uh, specialized in the historic value of monuments of this size. Uh, they're kind of all over the southeast right now. A lot of other cities, in fact, you know, in a lot of ways, 
Pensacola probably is one of the last to make the decision uh, on its Confederate monument. But, uh, but you know, so that's kind of put us a little bit behind the curve. Uh, but we are working to uh, to make that happen. And we think that that can be parallel parallelly done with uh, the um, with the lawsuits. So as those things are working, we can continue to keep finding the answers we need um, so that uh, should something happen, the injunction be broken, we will be able to move forward in that way. At this particular time, uh, we're obviously letting the, the court decision happen out. We understand absolutely the judge's decision when somebody comes in and claims they have an argument. Um, that, that argument needs to be heard, the decision needs to be made, and the city will comply with whatever decision comes out of the court system. This is from Jeremy. Any plan on reopening community centers? I, I would say not at this particular time. Uh, and Y'all can't see Keith, but he's shaking his head at this time looking at me. And, uh, and uh, so, I, I mean, I know that's the case. I, I don't think um, we made a decision to close uh, events all the way through August 31st. Um, I think you'll see us keep our community centers closed through August 31st. Um, as we said before, back if you remember back in May, we talked with you very clearly on this. Uh, we believe that every effort should be made to keep businesses open. Um, the city should not create any additional um, uh challenges or 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 likelihood that this virus would spread further and create complications that might close businesses uh i mean we our first number one priority is to um is to our health of our citizens and our community our second um priority is to the economic well-being of our community and what's happening with its business so um we're not going to allow any particular um uh thing that that we do with the community center unless it deals with the overall health of our community things like feeding programs will continue to go on uh things of those nature um we, we've got a number of efforts happening at all of our centers whether it's dealing with the elderly or whether it's dealing with uh those that are very young uh in school age uh, we will continue to keep doing our uh, our work that we're doing with uh with with feeding uh we also um I think United Way of Vickery will continue to do things that they can do with daycare for uh, for first responders and things. So anything that deals with the priority of our health, I see continuing to do. But otherwise, we're not going to we're not going to open our or do anything at our community centers that would jeopardize and create either either jeopardize our health or jeopardize our economy. Uh, we absolutely want to be keeping as many things open as possible. We want you to be able to go to as many stores as possible and retail, but when you do it, we want you to do it with a mask. Um, that's got to happen. And again, I, I will say one thing, I, I'm continuing to see more businesses, even in the unincorporated area of the county, uh, require masks um, because they feel like it is, it is, it's the right thing to do for their business and the right thing to do for their customers. Um, and we would we would simply echo that decision. And this is a follow up question from Andrew about um, the soccer complex. I believe when we were talking about that earlier, he was asking about the costs coming back higher um, and how much higher. Um, I, I'm thinking we were about five hundred thousand feet um, higher than he's going to look at me. So. I don't have that number sitting right in front of me. Um, uh, so, uh, Kareth, are you, are you nodding correctly? Is that what we were? Yeah, I think I think that, that's where we were, somewhere okay. around. Okay, we were about five hundred thousand more than more than budgeted. Obviously, where our LOST stands at this point, um, any overrun is a huge problem for us, and we've got to rethink uh, ways that we can pull um, pull those numbers down. Um, so Brian has continued to work with that. Gareth is working with it. Um, you know, at this point, um, we, we've just LOST is probably the hardest hit area that we've been with um, with uh, with uh, with COVID. And so at this point, I, I don't think we can really we've, we've got to do everything we can to get that project back within budget. Um, but the good news is, is it turns out. Um, the time we, we lost and what we thought we really wanted to complete to start the fall soccer season, we're not going to be starting the fall soccer season. That's that's pretty clear. Um, like I said, I, I talked this morning with some people. 
uh, they would like to be able to do some clinics, some other things, but they agree that um, they felt like it was unreasonable. They didn't want to risk their own kids or other kids um, doing the soccer season this fall. So we're going to shoot for spring. Um, and we're obviously, we're going to wait as long as we can on some other choices for uh, some other sports uh, and our kids' athletics. But we, again, have closed everything through um, August 31st. Um, so at this point, um, our community centers, our, our, our fields for youth sports are going to be closed through the 31st of August. I believe there are some sports, some softball. Uh, when you look on that scale, um, softball was one of those things that seemed like it had fairly good social distance. Um, so at this point, the decision we talked about was keeping that open uh, and letting that season play itself out. Uh, but things that are indoors, volleyball, basketball, we have, you know, um, those were those were rated as very high probability of spread. Um, so we talking with Brian Cooper, we have made a decision not to to open those sports at this particular time. Um, and we hate it because we know there are a lot of kids out there that participate in this and, and, and depend on this. But at this point, it's just been too risky for us to uh, us to, to open it and, and, and create a you know, risk of expo exposure and spread. All right, I don't see any new questions, so I think we are wrapped up here. Well, good. Thank you very much. We will get back. Um, we will have you back. The information that you need on on the um, uh, the numbers once we have those um, for both yesterday's numbers and then today's, we should have that by noon. Um, again, I, I don't know if there was a challenge yesterday with one of the people that usually sends me an email um, if they were off or, or other things on the weekends, it's sometimes hard to, to get information, but we will update you as soon as we have that information. Uh, we are speaking with the hospitals today at two o'clock and I will be doing a Facebook Live again on Wednesday. Um, so from this point, uh, again, we, we ask that you continue to follow the things that we're doing, uh, ask you to socially distance, wash your hands and wear a mask. If you can do those three things, uh, we think we can make a difference and we ask for all of you to help. Thank you very much.